officially begin. What are you seeing? The statue of Sybil Luddington in Carmel, New York, where the little video took place. What do you notice? Right away, something about the story is different. When I told you, remember the part where Sybil's father, Colonel Henry Luddington, instructed his other two daughters, Mary and Becky, to put knee breeches on their sister, and they all laughed? Well, that's a little different than the statue. How is Sybil dressed? What's she wearing? That's right, a dress. You would have called it a petticoat, and she's riding side saddle. That's how women would indeed ride. Now, the story has certain facts. First and foremost, it was, well, not written down. Nothing was really written about it until Sybil was in her mid-70s and she applied for a pension, money from the government to help her in her old age for having served the new United States by being in the American Revolution. She was to have gotten a pension. She described in great detail to a government official at the US Post Office how she helped her father with his regiment, the 7th Dutchess County Militia. And remember, what were militia men? Go ahead and whisper it, write it down. Um, guys with guns? Well, a little bit more. Most of the time, they were farmers, blacksmiths, wheelwrights, apothecaries, shopkeepers, teachers, lawyers, etc. But when there was danger, like an attack by the British redcoats or cowboys who might be trying to steal their cows and other possessions and bring them down to New York City and sell them to the British, the alarm would go out and the militia would be called up. They were ready to fight when needed. They weren't trained, but they were still pretty good. And Sybil was charged by her father with going out to round up the militiamen. And that's exactly what she did, though it did not get written down until the time of her pension, and then it didn't really have the full story written down until about a hundred years after she made her ride. So how do we know it's true? Well, we don't know the whole thing is true, but we do know this. There's something that I'm practicing right now with you, the great oral tradition of storytelling. People told the tale of Sybil's ride. They told how she may have come to their door and they repeated it time after time after time. And Sybil throughout her life told the tale of how she made the ride and got congratulated by George Washington. So most everyone around in what's now Putnam County, which was part of then in the revolution, Southern Dutchess County knew about Sybil's ride. So it's the oral tradition, it's our first primary source. The second would then be, well, other things like the lists of the soldiers in Colonel Luddington's regiment. That's how we know where she rode and how I was able to give you a few names like Ebenezer and Zachariah, Sam and John. Those were on the lists of Colonel Luddington's Southern Dutchess County Militia. All right, hold on. I'm going to show you something else. Ah, do you see this? It's the facts. First, there was nothing written down. And second, things were written down. The British described their attack in a report made by the British General Tryon to his commander, General Sir Henry Clinton. And we do know from the British report that about 1,500 redcoats or regular British soldiers landed in ships on the Long Island Sound near Westport, Connecticut, 
and they marched north. And it was true, if you so much as looked at those troops in the wrong way, why, they might have ordered the Hessians, who were helping the British fight against the Americans, Hessians, of course, were German soldiers, to burn down that house, burn down that rebel house. A rebel, that was someone who was on the side of the new United States. They were rebelling against the king and Great Britain. They wanted the United States of America, and thus they called themselves American Patriots. Now, here's what the British took when they got to Danbury. See if you can uh, read along ahead of me. A quantity of ordnance stores with iron, etc. What do you think they would have wanted iron for? Hmm. Could be. Yes. For weapons to make into guns. 4,000 barrels of beef and pork. Hmm. Getting hungry? What about uh, if you're a vegetarian, you might like the 100 large tierces of biscuits. Can you guess what a terce might be? Then they had rice, 120 puncheons of rum. Well, rum indeed plays a part of the British attack on Danbury. And then it goes on. Stores of wheat, oats, Indian corn, that's the different colored corn you'd get around at Halloween now. Uh, 30 pipes of wine, that's a bottle actually. 100 hogshead of sugar, sugar was rare and taxed in those days. Ditto on the molasses, that means, ditto means hogsheads from the, the previous line. Coffee, medicines, saltpeter. Ooh, what's saltpeter? Um, not some weird organic salt your, your, your aunt uses, but a kind of boom, ingredient in gunpowder. And then there's tents, iron boilers to keep the guys cooking. Um, hospital bedding, engineers, pioneers, carpenters, tools, a printing press, tar to patch things up, tallow for candles, and 5,000 pairs of shoes and stockings. You know, they say an army marches on its stomach, but really it's on their shoes and stockings. And now, what does that next line say down there? 19 houses were burned, as was the meeting of the Danbury Society, and 22 stores and barns were burned too, and all their contents. That was the American supply place, a depot. And you know, two years before Sybil made a ride, in April of 1777, Paul Revere went out. He was 40 years old, rode 16 miles, had two guys helping him, he told John Hancock and a handful of other people, and they told others too before, yep, his horse got stolen. Sybil was 16, rode about 40 miles, and rounded up a few hundred men, and did not get her horse stolen. So, a big difference, but the same thing where they, they were warning about the Redcoats, the regular army coming to take the supplies of the American patriots who the British uh, called rebels. And look at this, this is from a journal written by some American about how the Tories, those were Americans on the side of the king, acted. And this is from someone who was there, a primary source. The drunken men went up and down Main Street, <laughs> in squads singing army songs like, Yankee Doodle went to town shouting coarse speeches, down with the rebels, let's far and feather them, far and tether them, whatever. Oh, they're a bunch of rascals, they're puppies. Ooh, rascals, puppies. Back in 1777, those were like curse words. And they were hugging and swearing and yelling and conducting themselves as becomes an invader when he is very, very drunk. Well, that was a report. And that's why the messenger came to the Luddington's house. Well, I talked to you about the Seventh Duchess uh, uh, militia there, and some of the men who were among the 400 listed, and all of them, well, most of them came out. But let's remember, let's go back to this. Sybil. 
She's wearing a dress, riding side saddle. Well, many historians believe, and they put things together they know about the times, that Sybil probably would have worn her father's knee breeches to be safe. Because women usually did not go out riding alone at night. They might get themselves stopped or in trouble. That's what her mother and sisters worried about. So it's likely, and this is why I put it in the story, she wore men's pants. And remember in those days, 1777, women never ever would wear pants. Oh my gosh, you wouldn't catch me dead wearing pants. It just did not happen. It was not the style. So Sybil would have been in a real, disguise as a young man, and she could pretend she was drunk to get away from the guards at the Morris house. And remember, Morris, he was part of the Phillips family. They were the richest family in the colonies, and they probably owned some of the land right where Crompond Elementary School uh, is back in the 1770s. Of course, the Phillips family sided with the king. And that meant Morris, who was a son-in-law of the Phillips, had, ah, who goes there? Armed guards when Sybil tried to go by, and she did manage to get by because she was dressed like a young man. But we don't have proof, but it's likely. Now, Sybil managed to get through and round up all of those men. And she reported uh, to her father, who then took all the men, and they went and they joined the Connecticut forces to drive out the Redcoats. Now, do you remember one of the men, the officers in charge in Connecticut? Um, yes, there was a General Wooster. Poor Wooster and his son got killed. Uh, in the battle. There's a little town named after him there. But the other fellow from Connecticut, the general, Washington's favorite fighting general, Benedict Arnold, the hero of the Battle of Saratoga. Remember that? The turning point to the revolution. That's where, when the British lost the battle and had to give up their guns, the Americans probably sang, Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, and they sang it in a proud way, even though they may still not have been macaronis wearing the finest, fanciest clothes. Well, off those men went, and when they arrived in Ridgefield, Colonel Ludington had to let General Benedict Arnold take command of all his troops. And they had a big battle at Ridgefield, Connecticut. And if you go to Keeler's Tavern, you'll see a British cannonball still in the wall there. The Americans, however, drove off those red coats. And, well, here's something a little bit, uh, a little weird and scary. If you don't like weird, scary things, you can turn off the sound right now while I tell this part of the story. And when I put my hands up, you can unmute, and then we'll go back to our regularly scheduled workshop here. Here's the kind of weird, scary part. Not too long ago, when construction was going on in Ridgefield, Connecticut, a shovel scraped across human bones, protruding from the ground. And the construction workers, big burly guys, <laughs> began to cry with fear. Who did those bones belong to? Why, they may have been some of the men Sybil Luddington rounded up who were shot. They could have been British soldiers or Connecticut soldiers, but they may have been from around, well, here in New York, and their bones have just been found. Oh, so certain parts of the revolution linger on. I wonder if those boned bodies are now ghosts. 
All right, you can put your sound back on. Oh, well, after, hold on a second here. I've got to get us back. You see me now? Yes. Well, after Colonel Luddington's men drove off the Redcoats under the command of General Benedict Arnold, Benedict Arnold went on to, well, become a traitor. The most famous traitor, he was a turncoat, changed his blue to his red coat, went from the American side to the British side. But that's a story for another time. And there's a part of that tale in Crompond, New York. If you look over my, oops, over there, that fellow, Major John Andre, he came passing right through Crompond with plans for West Point to give from Benedict Arnold to the British, and if he had gotten through down to New York City, why, the British would have won the American Revolution. But again, a story for another time. But now, at this time, I'm going to ask you to write down a few writing ideas. I'll give you a writing prompt, and it is here. Hold on for a moment um, while I get us um, set up. But I want you to, while I'm finding the written part of it, you can see the written part of it after, um, to do this. Um, Here we go. Pretend you made Sybil's ride. In a letter, describe to a friend what happened and how you felt. You may make up your own character for the letter if you like. But remember, your friend wants details, describing details. How was it cold and dismal that night? Um, when you came to the houses of the men your father needed for his militia, how did they react? Were they afraid? Were they surprised? Did they want to stay in bed? Um, were you afraid of getting attacked? Remember when Morris's guards found you? What else could you have done to have gotten away with them? What about when the cowboys, remember the guys who would steal cows and sell them, um, steal cows from Westchester farmers and sell them to the British down in New York City? How would you have gotten around them? Would you have done what Sybil did and pretended that you had smallpox? Describe that in your letter. How did you feel when it was over? And finally, how did you feel when George Washington shook your hand? Congratulations. Well, that's our first little prompt. Now, when you write the letters, here's something to help you. Be back again. Not this. Uh, where did it go? It's a wonderful list of colonial words and idioms. Oh, you're already looking at it. You can Add these, use at least five of these in your writing. Um, oh, my Luffy was worried I might get caught by the cowboys. I was dressed in a frock coat. I thought I was a macaroni. I ate my Oli Coke and went out for my ride to round up the men. I was no Paul Troon. These are all real words people used back in the 18th century. So you'll get a copy of that too. Well, friends, let's talk about this fine fellow over here. I'm bringing up uh, a wonderful American artist, an illustration he did of a macaroni. See the fellow in the green coat, dressed all fine and fancy, and who do you see um, 
off in front of him and the red cape kind of laughing. Well, a British red coat and back these fellows with the funny hats, all teasing, they're British. Uh, they're probably grenadiers there. And the fellow with the green coat is dressed in macaroni style and he's getting teased. But the fellow way in the corner over here, sitting with the stick, he's dressed more like a Yankee doodle in, in plain, ordinary clothes. Because remember, Yankee doodle came to town. Yankee doodle is a, uh, it means Johnny Stinky Cheese, the idiot kind of in Dutch, although the Dutch would have said Yankee's doodle. Doodle is like dead wood or a bunch of squiggly lines that the wood makes. And riding on a pony, that's what children do. They ride a pony. And you stick a feather in your hat and you think you're dressed in the finest, fanciest clothes called macaroni. So our story of the French at Crom Pond begins with Yankee Doodle. And that's how the Americans looked, like a bunch of Yankee Doodles, Johnny Stinky Cheese, the idiot in bad clothes. Many of them would show up to fight without even shoes, without guns. And how did those bumpkins, those farm boys, become a fine fighting force? It took a lot of effort and fighting and hardship and death to finally become what the French saw at Crompond in 1782. Why? The Americans wearing fine uniforms and keeping them fine, keeping them in good order and knowing how to march, knowing how to be disciplined. And so I'll show you who was extremely proud. There he is. Can you guess? General George Washington, kind of at ease. He's maybe looking out toward Crompond right there, um, thinking one day there'll be a fine elementary school there. And um, we'll call it uh, Washington, no, we'll call it Crompond. Now, we're gonna go in uh, for uh, a closer look. Let me see if I can find it for you, please. So do bear with me here. Um, nope, it's not there, but it is in another place. So I'm gonna go back to me and show you that, well, we can look again at Washington right here. You'll be able to see. If you look down next to his knees and near the horse's knees, you'll see the Hudson River, and that's in the Hudson Highlands where the Bear Mountain Bridge is. And all camped there were French and American troops. And that's where the Marquis de Lafayette came up to Washington and said, as I said in the story, uh, General Washington, what your, your men, they are uh, a fine fighting force. And you must have made a, uh, an agreement with the King of Prussia who has the best looking soldiers, the best uniforms, for your men are now the best. That was a high compliment to compare the Americans who were once Yankee doodles to the King of Prussia's army. Oh, Prussia, where is that, by the way? Um, it was a country that doesn't really exist anymore. It was kind of in between Germany and Russia, not Poland or Ukraine, but its own separate country. So, what a compliment. And Rochambeau also noted that he was impressed that Americans who wanted independence, liberty, and to be the, their own selves, to have their own fate, would follow someone like Washington. And they did because Rochambeau found Washington was a good man, a fine character. So, I'll share now a few other sources about uh, the story of the French at Crom Pond. So yes, I told you about Yankee Doodle. It meant um, Johnny Stinky Cheese with dead wood in his head, rode a baby horse like a little kid. He thinks a feather in his hat made him look cool. 
and then the song goes on. Yankee Doodle, keep it up. Yankee Doodle Dandy, mind the music, watch your step, and with the girls be handy. And that means you better watch it, or else we're gonna get you rebels, and we'll take your girlfriends too. <laughs> that was what was in that Norman Rockwell um, painting. Now, where did that story come from? Why, not too far from Crompond on the Hudson River in the French-Indian Wars, a British doctor in the 1750s saw Connecticut militiamen, remember the militia, not trained, but ready to fight in a minute's notice, but they didn't often have uniforms. They were wearing plain patched clothes when they arrived, and the British doctor made up the verses Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat and called it, well, you know, and it stuck. And when the American Revolution broke out, that song was used to bully the Americans. But of course, as you learned at the Battle of Saratoga and at the final battle at the end of the revolution, the Battle of Yorktown, well, by the way, that's why uh, the town of, Yorktown is named Yorktown after Yorktown, Virginia, where the final battle happened. It's been said and reported by the likes of the Marquis de Lafayette and Benedict Arnold that the Americans proudly sang Yankee Doodle. So there it is. Okay. Well, my friends, here's something else. I have a little writing prompt for you. And uh, this should be, could be fun to imagine you were living in Crompond in 1782 from September to October when the French were there. Imagine, what would it have been like if they were camped on your farm? Would you have given them food? Would you have let them... Um, go in your house? Uh, would you have given them firewood? Remember that story about the firewood? There was some fellow, of course, who try, tried to charge Rochambeau 15,000 francs for the firewood he used. Ah, how ungrateful. After all, the French were there to help the Americans to be a a show of force, a presence of soldiers to stop the British from coming up the Hudson River and taking over again, and they just need a little firewood. The least you could do is let him keep it. But what did that guy do? He tried to have Rochambeau arrested. You remember how it turned out. Why, that farmer who wanted to have Rochambeau arrested to pay him 15,000 francs had to pay 2,000 francs himself to, to the new US government. In your letter to your friend, Maybe you could describe how you knew that farmer. What was he like? That could be part of your letter. What do you think about the French uniforms, their food, um, maybe some songs they sing? You could put that in a letter describing what was it like when the French were on your farm? And where can you turn to to get ideas? Well, you could maybe look up what kind of uniforms did they have? What kind of food did they eat back in those days? You already knew from the list of what the British took. They ate beef and rice and Indian corn and things like that. Well, let me see. I may have, before we wrap up, a few other, maybe another picture or two. You like seeing pictures, don't you? And then we can wrap things up and get you started on your, on your piece. So here we go. This is, will help you with your, um, here we go, I've got to share it with you. Here is a painting of what Westchester looked like when, you can see here, Washington and behind him, Rochambeau are riding through and behind them, it looks like the American forces, maybe they're marching right through um, 
crom pond there. And maybe that's um, your parents standing with your, your little sister watching them come by. It looks like crom pond is right behind them. You know, crom pond in Dutch means crooked pond. I'll send this along to you as well to give you an idea of what it must have been like. So friends, I'm gonna meet with you um, in a Zoom session with each of your classes. And there, I'd like you to have a little bit of your writing started. And then I can help you make it better. So you'll have a letter that you could stand up and read out loud and, you know, post it on Instagram or, or maybe on uh, uh, Facebook or YouTube and let other people know what it was like when the French were in Crompon, your town, during the American Revolution, or how did it feel when you had to make a ride like Sybil's? What were the dangers? How did you get by? You know what? You could help out kids in Arizona and California who are like, dude, we have like nothing on the American Revolution. Like California is like so young. All we have is like surfing and all we have in Arizona is sand. You have the French at Crom Pond. You have civil riding right by in your neighborhood and you can tell about it. So I wanna be able to help you. So have a little bit of writing to start us off in our workshops uh, when I meet with each class uh, separately. Well, friends, I hope this has been fun and informative. I've enjoyed it, and I'll see you again soon. So... This little session of Teaching by Tales for the, uh, the fine fourth graders at Crompon School is now over. Thank you again. Don't forget to write. <laughs>